so post bull market actions. Now, this is very premature, and I will be doing a very in-depth session on this summer next year, maybe, or whenever it seems that we're approaching the end. But again, whilst going through my old slides, I found this slide from a year ago. And it was basically my personal game plan. And back then, obviously, as I said, it wasn't that well fleshed out. But it was this. Simon's super simple secret sexy set play. <laughs> and it was buy crypto, all in. Because this, you know, we're really emerging from the bear market, so to speak, and I wanted to get allocated. Step two, wait until December 2025. <laughs> um, which again, as you now know, I'm I'm putting way less weight on that arbitrary date because there's nothing that actually makes it a, a real thing. Hello? Yeah. Hello, come in. Howdy. And then uh, step three, sell everything. So that was the plan a year and a bit ago. Now, obviously, I'm a massive disciple of the liquidity cycle. And obviously, the, like, the more I read into this, and I'm constantly looking into it, and not just Michael Howell's perspective, but other perspectives, it really is the, the, the magic blueprint to modern finance. Literally, it, it, that chart explains everything. Um, so the question I ask myself a lot, and I all, also am asked a lot, is when is the bull market peak? Obviously, um, it's a question that we don't really know. Uh, so instead of having a set arbitrary date, for me personally, it's those bullet points, as I mentioned earlier. And those bullet points are this. So I am process driven, not timeline driven, okay? So I'm waiting, so we've been waiting for this bit for, for what seems like forever, we've now got it. I'm expecting negative rates. So this, in the Q&A bit, I'll talk about this more in depth, but I'm expecting not rates just to flatline again. I think they'll go through the floor even more so than they did last time. Um, just because of the maths of the debt, the interest payments, uh, and again, uh, yeah, the liquidity cycle. In this bit here, I should add in crash of some sort, and I, I do believe it will be a relatively short-lived thing. They cannot let things tumble. They literally can't. The, the whole too big to fail thing is way bigger now than it was in 2008. They have no solution. They have to print. And then when this happens, if stocks are still falling, crypto, I, I do believe, will disconnect. At some point, there will be, a, well, there is most likely to be a disconnection between crypto and stocks um, because it's very sensitive to global liquidity. Um, and that, yeah, so when is it going to peak? Sometime after this. Um, so, and then this is my, my, the old chart, the old faithful. And I, I've always looked at the fractals differently to the halving cycle. I personally have always viewed the, the, the fractal cycles where the halving is the beginning of the cycle. Whereas I know most of the internet look at it differently. But I, because this is the only fixed thing in Bitcoin, I've always used that as the beginning of the cycle. So, and remember, as a trader, after 20 years of trading, the, one of the most important things I can share with you is stop hunting for the why. You will drive yourself doolally hunting for the why. And I spent the, probably the first seven years of my trading career looking at a chart, something goes up, and then I'm like, why did that happen? And then I try and research everything around, like, why did it go up, or why did it go down? You'll grow gray hair. I'm 38, I've got gray hairs already. Um, but, so what I've realized is that you'll lead a much more profitable and easier life when you forget the why, you just look at the charts, and it, it's just pattern recognition. Like, why are we scared of lions and tigers? Well thousands of years of pattern recognition that if you go towards them, you probably will get hurt. So, and humans are good at pattern recognition. Um, it's built in us. And there are still patterns that are repeating within my fr fractal cycle. One of the, fr the, the patterns which have been predictive is we have the halving and there's always a wobble around the halving. I don't care why, I don't care what, you know, what the miner's doing. 
Is there or isn't there a wobble around the halvings where we have consolidation or even a, a move down? Yes, yes. This is the weekly chart, a uh, monthly chart, don't forget. So it looks small there, but that's pretty big. Yes, definitely. And what about now? Yes. So the wobble in price action we've had recently here, how similar does that look to here or, or even here? Or even here? It, so for me personally, I look at the fractals differently than Twitter or, or whatever. I see the halvings as the beginning of the fractal, and we've just entered the last predictable cycle, in my opinion. And Bitcoin isn't an exponential tech in terms of price. It's exponential in, in terms of the ecosystem around it, as in um, the, the compute power around it, the, 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 the exponential amount of sort of resources flowing into it. But when you plot, so Bitcoin price is a power law. It's not an exponential. OK, so exponential, something exponential is bottom left to top right on a on a log linear chart. So if this was linear and that was a log axis, something exponential goes from bottom left, diagonal line, strip top right, okay? We all know Bitcoin is not exponential. It peters off, right? It was exponential to a degree and then it disconnected. But what, what Bitcoin price action is, is a power law. And a power law is a perfect straight line from bottom left to top right on a log log plot. So that's what it is. So when people talk about diminishing returns and all that sort of stuff, I think they're really confusing the difference between exponential growth and power law growth. But Bitcoin is a perfect power law. So, yeah, but going back to pattern recognition, did we have the anticipated wobble? Yes, we did. Um, and to me, I've, obviously I don't know the real reasons why, but I do find it quite curious how all the highs have been plus or minus you know, 30 days from the 1st of December, but also the lows, the peak lows have always been plus or minus 45 days from the 1st of December, a year later, every single time. Um, and my, uh, the, this is my multiple here. Um, these have been pretty spot on, and so is the FIB. So when you look at the 38.2 FIB from the previous high, it, you, that orange line is always hit. Um, six months, you know, well, so this line should be hit within that period before each halving and every single time it has, um, thankfully to the upside. So yeah, I'm, I'm still putting weight on that personally. But when you're down in the dumps, the single chart that really gives me, well, other than the five year liquidity cycle, the thing that really gives me comfort, as I text out the other day, is the total market cap chart. Honestly, you can be really down in the dumps, but just take a look at that. Like, even if I'm being so pessimistic and I think, okay, well, last cycle we hit three trillion with no big boys and girls in it. What if we only hit five trillion? And five trillion puts us to below this sort of, this best fit curve here, so to speak. And then imagine BitTensor only being 0.5% of the market cap. You're still looking at $3,000 tau at least. So half a percent of total market cap and only being a $5 trillion market cap. This is the biggest asymmetric return I've ever seen and the easiest one I've ever seen. So it is very frustrating that we're like, yes, all the fun time stuff is going to happen in, the, in a year. So it's just the waiting is more painful than anything else. That's a log chart. Yeah. So, well, linear log. So when most people talk about a log chart, it's log linear. Not, a, yeah, because you have a log log plot. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing at log 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 plot. <coughs> what, what do you mean by that? <laughs> when the x-axis is in a log, logarithmic scale. So if you look at time on a log chart, it looks like time is being compressed. Um, so yeah, this is always linear. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not? No, it's not. So if you draw it on a normal chart, it wouldn't be that. Oh, it does. It looks like so on a linear, linear chart. Yeah. It looks exponential, yeah. but it's not. <laughs> it looks, but it's not, because you you can only gauge an ex something exponential when you're looking at a linear log chart, and a linear log chart, an exponent is perfect diagonal straight line from bottom left to top right. So, 
There's, I'm being pedantic here, but in a world of pedant, pedants, I was going to say pedos. <laughs> in a world of pedos, you've got to be pedantic. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, YouTube is going to love this video. <laughs> so, yeah. So on a linear chart, if you look at Bitcoin, it looks like we. It looks exponential to the untrained, unpedo eye, <laughs> unpedantic eye. But, if, but it's not. It's only exponential. It, I mean, if you cut Bitcoin from here onwards, then yeah, it, it, you'd say up, up to a point, Bitcoin was an exponential um, cur um, price curve, but it's not. Anyway. This is my, my comfort, warm, my warm comfort blanket when I'm late at night depressed. Um, not that I am. But, and and the, again, another pattern recognition thing here is that there is always a bit of a consolidation type wobble roughly a year before the peak. And it happens on the total crypto market cap chart to be a falling compression in a rising market, which as you all know is my favorite freaking pattern in, in trading. So, and here we are now, falling compression within a strong rising market. I expect something like this to occur. And I'm, yeah, a bit of a cop out, but I'm expecting anywhere from, say, six to $12 trillion this bull market. Um, and I do call the left translated cycle people idiots, um, personally. I think they're, they're, they're looking at just a very small section of data and then being very loud about that small section of data and they're missing the whole macro picture. So yeah, we had same situation here, we, same situation here, we, just, we're in the wee bit. I we just wanna hurry up with the wee bit. So, um, I've stolen this next slide from my book, sorry. Um, I'm gonna mention my book a few times until you all actually get it. <laughs> so in one of the chapters, I was like, right, this is my to-do to -do list in crypto. So get my portfolio set up, allocated before the crazy bull market starts in 2025. Be AI heavy uh, in my portfolio in order to properly surf that hype wave. Um, oh, and by the way, so I'm, but I was nodding to all of Harry's presentation. Um, no, I, I genuinely was. No, no, no. I'm, there's no but at all. Um, the, one of the things that I've also learned in history is that when you have cr like really accurate predictive indicators of some sort, <laughs> It never catches the, the pico low or the pico top, and that's because of humans. We always over exacerbate a move, whether it's to the downside, we exacerbate it to the downside, and at the peak, you have the Johnny Come Latelys aping in at the last moment, you know, the NFT hunters and all that sort of stuff. So it's us dumb idiots that over exaggerate certain moves. So, but anyway, start scaling out profits from Q4 2025 again. This, is, this will be process driven, not time driven, but this is my best thumb in the air of when I think that will happen, or perhaps early, depending on what's going on in the world and the bigger macro metrics. So I'm looking, waiting for the stimmies. When scaling up profits, move as little as possible into fiat. It may be hazardous getting back those funds back into crypto, especially under a Harris administration, because she's not crypto friendly. Um, so I'd likely be phasing out, sidestepping into the strongest stable coin at the time. Currently, it's Tether never been audited properly that's still a ticking time bomb in my opinion but at the moment it's got the biggest market cap and it's growing strong if casper looks like it's doing a fractal that's following its own beat which i expect it might uh, despite a wider bear market i may flop heavily into casper so that's more of a wish that's a wish list hope then the prof sorry, I'm just reading it all out, but I've got nothing else to add. <laughs> the profits I pull out into Sterling will only be for buying a forever home and funding the, six, the next six crazy, I'm going to call them projects, not businesses. They're not a business until they're running properly. Uh, I'm planning to launch in 2026. Uh, the rest I'll be keeping in a stable coin so it's safe to start dipping my toes back into crypto or Casper, according to my simple base support method I explained earlier in the book. So... Where are we now? We've done this bit, done this bit, and I'm just waiting for checkpoint number three. And that will be over the next 12 months. Having said that, I know I said I'm gonna start scaling out towards the end of the bull market. 
that, to be honest, there are certain tau price points where I will be forced to take money out into the real world because Ellie really wants that house. <laughs> it's been 16 years of kicking that can down the road. I can't kick it any longer. So, um, yeah. Anywho, um, so that's that. So I will be watching with hawk eyes uh, over this area here, fully expecting a, market, a stock market crash of some sort. Um, I'm personally worried about this, or I'm concerned, I'm not worried. I, it's not like I, I lose sleep over it, but I genuinely believe, because when you look at the trends, you, CBDCs are coming. They're already out in Thailand on wide scale trials. Um, Anything you want to get back into crypto, I think, will be so hard. You're going to be, yeah. I mean, we're currently, with a certain project, going through all sorts of KYC, anti-money laundering checks, uh, counter-terrorist checks, checks, just opening bank accounts and stuff like that. And I had, <laughs> and I had this thing, like, I sent this twice. I've had to do certified you know, form signing and send them off. And one of them got rejected by the bank literally a couple of days ago because I hadn't signed my passport. I was like, what? I didn't know there was a signature part of the passport. But on the new passports, it's on the, you open it up, it's on the top bit. So sign it if you ever. So that was a bit of a faff. Um, so yeah. Anywho, um, yeah, again, I'm hoping Casper does its thing. So this, is, I'm not gonna, this will be a, a proper in-depth slide next year. But these are my crazy projects that I want to allocate some funds into. So uh, Steve and I have set up an AI VC fund already, um, and we're doing, well, trying to do stuff. Did I talk about Tensor ads yet? Have I? No? Well, I'm sort of being like a, a vulture at the moment, because BitAds has gone kaput. And there's all sorts of tweaks that I suggested to them, you know, behind the scenes, which they haven't done, and I'm not surprised. Now, now I have a bit better picture chatting with some of the other validators why BitAds didn't succeed. I can't tell you if this, I keep forgetting this is going on YouTube at some point. Long story short, I, um, I want to set up Tensor ads. And so that will be going under the umbrella of Steve and I's AI VC type thing. Whether that works or not, I don't know. As I said, all of these are projects um, I want to yeah, I'll talk about CRISPR another time. I think you've heard me talk about my Project Elon stuff. Yeah, level, this is basically all reliant on level five type stuff. But um, yeah, the robots are coming. Uh, that's a silly project. I won't talk about that yet. And then the hedge fund. So this is something which I've kept close to my chest. But over the last, I don't know, nine months or something like that, we've. Um, Two other people and I have been setting up our own crypto hedge fund. And um, yeah, I've teamed up with two people that have been very good in the property fund world. They've done it before. And uh, so we're officially live. DSV. I wanted a silly name for this fund, but apparently you have to be quite sensible in big boy world. So I wanted something like Honey Badger Capital or something, because I am a honey badger by, by my spirit animal. But it's called DSV, very boring. Um, and this is a full-on crypto hedge fund. And after all that work, what do we get to show for it? A form that looks like it was made on Microsoft Word. <laughs> it probably was made on Microsoft Word. But that was a lot of hard work and effort. So John, can you raise your hand, please? John is the CEO of DSV Ventures. Um, sorry? <laughs> yeah, and bears all the responsibility <laughs> as director. Um, I'm simply the lowly CIO, so I'm the chief investment officer. Uh, and we've got Rob, who's the COO, who's doing a lot of the admin bullshit at the moment. Um, you'll, you'll meet Rob. And at a later stage, once with the dust has settled and we've actually got inflow in it, I, I, I will be, I hope you don't mind, I'll bring you up and interrogate, I mean, interview you uh, in front of everyone. But it's still early days. So everything's set up legally, structurally, but we now have a proper crypto hedge fund. And I've already lifted up my skirt and sh shared every conflict of interest I could possibly find. And all was OK, wasn't it? Yes. 
So um, I've even said I will be going 70, 80% into Tau, 20, 30% into Casper, a couple of percent Tau Noon, Zappy, no objections. Even though I, you know, by doing that, I'd be boosting my own personal pots because I'm in all them as well. I'd be boosting all of RT's pots because I've told everyone else to do that. Every other conflict of interest, I, yeah. So all has been approved. So I, yeah, I'm a touch wood and pinching skin and all that sort of stuff. Sorry? Yeah, they're, they're very crypto friendly and a lot of funds are set up in the Bahamas. Um, FTX was also set up in the Bahamas, come to think of it, <laughs> out of memory. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's, it's quite bullish because uh, let's say we, ha we, we flop a little bit and we only get $50 million in, in inflow. If we get that relatively soon, that 50 million could easily 10x, especially as we're going very heavy tau. So that 50 million dollars could very easily turn into 500 million. Um, so yeah, of all of the little projects, this is this one's actually the first one that's actually what's the thing? Showing teeth, bearing teeth, growing teeth. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Anyway, <laughs> but the thing which I genuinely think about every single day is AI and robots. And I keep coming back to this part here. Now this seems like a really boring part of my future, hopefully not a future cluster mess, but I keep coming back to this because everything around here does actually revolve around this energy nodule type thing. And when you look at AI, and I wrote it down here actually, it was one of my, so my big lists of things whilst Harry was talking. Um, I drew a triangle and an AI thing here. So what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Who remembers me talking about primary, secondary, and tertiary asset tiers? Good. A, a couple, but I will go through it again. So I analyze billionaires, or I always have done, and I, I like to see what they're actually doing with their, their wealth as regards to what they say they, they want you, know, you should do. And so when you look at assets from a first principles perspective, you have three tiers. You have primary assets, secondary assets, and tertiary assets. And then maybe, you know, crazy derivative uh, tier. So if you look at <clears throat> most billionaires around these days, what they've done is they've made all of their wealth in the crazy, you know, let's call it the derivative tier, in the internet, let's say, social media, whatnot. Um, and what do they actually do with their, their wealth? They don't keep it in the internet. They extract it and put it in, and they start buying up loads of secondary and primary tier assets. So uh, the, the example I always use is copper. If you had a, a country or land with loads of copper uh, deposits, deep underground, doesn't even have to have roads or mines in, that is a tier one asset. So that will be copper, just raw copper, deep underground, boom. A secondary asset with that, or, of, of this would then be a mining company. So mining, uh, refinery of some sort, uh, tr uh, let's call it transport, and well, no, let's just call it logistics, logs. So railway tracks, uh, roads, just basic electricity supplies going into the refinery. Because to extract stuff deep underground, you have to build a whole ecosystem around that. And to set up a new mine, it takes 12 years on average to go from, right, here's stuff deep underground. So from finding it to extracting it, that's a, a decade process at the very least. And then up here, you've probably got, you know, um, copper ETFs. Can you see it's a, it's a derivative of the underlying core asset? So billionaires, they, you know, they've all made their lottery winnings up here with the internet or, or whatever. But what are they doing? That, you know, Bill Gates is the US's largest farmland owner. He's gone straight down here. Jeff Bezos is the US's biggest private landowner. Dyson. Straight down here. Dyson owns the UK, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, he's given my old school, like, close to 50 million pounds so far in charitable donations. It's just, um, so billionaires are constantly flowing down here. New York hedge fund managers are buying up New Zealand for bunkers, basically. Yes. Yeah. No. 
will know more about the exact location of um, mines. Is it that loads of people are legally mining stuff in the empire? Are they really? And they're all using Starlink. <coughs> That makes sense so because it's. Is basically now knows exactly where we're going to all the problems are. Huh. Um, so there's speculation that we're going to go after them, and that's why I thought it worked for us because we're going to. That's interesting. Oh, so that's why Brazil's kicking off. That makes sense. Brilliant. Ah, I love it when dots connect. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So. With this in mind, and the fact that I've, I've, I've looked at this for about 10 years, and every billionaire you can think of has basically harbored their wealth in tier one or primary and secondary tiers, I, I come to think of, right, wait a minute. If the, the world is going AI-based, where is AI on this? So if we were to draw up an AI tier So everyone's obsessed at the moment with the, the, the use case, the applications of AI, which is all up here, okay? So AI is going to you know, be a really good personal assistant. It's going to be a AAA, uh, autonomous AI agent, all that sort of stuff. All that is up here. What are the secondary and primary tiers? Now, the secondary type stuff will be you know, stuff like AWS, you know, server farms, all that sort of stuff. Um, Rigs. So this is where Josh comes in. Josh is, would be, let's say, a secondary asset or secondary tier to what AI is. I'm obsessed with here. The massive money is here. I'm, I'm low-key obsessed with primary energy generation. That, that, that is where I would like, if I made shitloads of money from crypto next year, touch wood, I would really want to just dump a whole load of it into energy infrastructure as a long-term wealth preservation play. Not, so this is going to be really boring. In fact, so I, I'm going to walk back a statement I just said. The, the real big money is up here. The long-term safe wealth preservation is here. So, oh yeah, that, that no, that I'm, I'm, the land is part of tier one, yeah. So, so when I when I look at stuff like this, I then go back. To, so yeah, so this is you know why Josh is very um, so a nice um, sort of shoehorn in here because these are some of the slides from the last cuddle. Okay, so who wasn't at the last cuddle? OK, fair few. OK, I'm going to breeze through this. Uh, hopefully, you've seen the video. So I made this presentation about how everyone is making really uninformed opinions about AI based on data that they, from stuff 10 years ago or whatnot. So that presentation was all about rapidly updating your knowledge set on AI. And I'll take a few of the slides, not all of them. So basically, compute is growing at 0.5 orders of magnitude a year. 0.5. That is just an incredible percentage. It's three times faster than Moore's law. Algo efficiencies and unhobbling and all that sort of stuff is another 0.5 um, orders of magnitude a year. So long, long story short, it's 5xing every four years in general. So not, uh, sorry, not 5xing, uh, five orders of magnitude every four years, which is roughly that per year. People are wildly underestimating the, 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 the cadence of AI. Chip production is the massive bottleneck. There's two companies in the world which, which basically holds the world to ransom. Um, you have uh, uh, T, uh, TSMC in Taiwan, which is what the world is fixated over, China's fixated over, and ASML in the Netherlands. So basically, TSMC would not be able to operate without ASML in the Netherlands. So if you wanted to take out computing and slow humanity down a decade, you take out that one company in the Netherlands. It's as easy as that. And it is crazy that humanity has built up its entire world on computing and chip production, yet you have a bottleneck of two companies. What you just need to take, sorry? What they do? They, it's lithography, I can never say it. So in order to, for TSMC, sorry, he's about to 
call the terrorists to take out AS <laughs> ASML. <laughs> Quick, Netherlands, ASML. <laughs> um, shit. <laughs> no. Anyway, um, yeah, so in order for TSMC to make the, the crazy chips that they do in Taiwan, they need this, I don't really understand, it's called lithography. Yeah. Literally. And to build another ASML, it's a 10 year process. To build another TSMC, it's a 10 to 12 year process. So America is now actually, the government, the US government is actually doing something with forward thinking initiative here. They're plowing, yeah, I know. They're plowing a load of money into trying to wean themselves off TSMC. So they're now trying to build out their own um, sovereign chip uh, creation centers. But again, it's 12 years. So, and what Vivek Ramaswamy was saying when he was running for his you know, elections was spot on. He was like, we're gonna have to be friendly with China for 12 years until we're not reliant on Taiwan and then we'll may give Taiwan back to them. And that's being as pra pragmatic as any politician can be, really. So the US will fight to death for Taiwan until, or at least for the next 12 years. That's my, yeah. Who did you say that? Vivek Ramaswamy, my personal favorite politician. Not that I like politicians. Anyway, um, and this is, this is an interesting interview. This is um, Larry Ellison, uh, founder of Oracle. Just listen to this. How's the hit going? It's done. Okay, sweet. <laughs> Just for our crypto pots, when is it gonna happen? Because crypto will tank. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is like Formula One. What do I mean by that? Really not one winner. I mean, you got three people on the podium. But it's really kind of one winner. Someone's going to be better than this than anybody else. And multiple people are trying. And there is a race. If you listen to Jensen Wong, and I'm sure you do. I know, I know you do because I've, I've seen his stock price. And I know... I, remember, I went to dinner with Elon Musk in Nobu Palo Alto. I went to dinner with Elon Musk, Jensen Wong, and, uh, and I went to dinner. And I would describe the dinner as Oracle and uh, me and Elon begging Jensen for GPUs. Please take our money. Please take our money. I, by the way, I got dinner. <laughs> Please take our money. Take, no, no, take more of it. You're not, you're not taking enough of it. We need you to take more of our money. Please. It went okay. It, was, it worked. I mean, we... we uh, yeah, I mean, the, the demand for GPUs, the, the desire to be first, the desire to build the, the most capable neural network in the world, getting there first is a big deal. So, as you know, there's a massive race for, for GPUs at the moment. So Elon's built out the biggest AI supercluster the world has ever seen. He did it in just over a month, um, literally. You should see the building, it's huge. Um, so that's the biggest supercluster. He bought a whole bunch of H100s uh, from Jensen. Uh, Oracle still doing the same. Um, the, so the world, all the billionaires, all the corporations, they're really focusing on this. The, how many GPUs can, can one buy? How many TPUs can one buy? Because GPUs are great for graphics and stuff like that. But for AI, there are better, better versions. So there's a new, um, TPUs, so tensor processing units that are more AI specific chips, which Grok with a Q, not, not a K, not the Elon Grok, the other Grok uh, are making. So just like with Bitcoin mining, it started with GPUs, but then someone came along and went, hmm, an ASIC would be much better, a completely dedicated Bitcoin mining rig. And then ASICs went through the, through the roof. So we are seeing TPUs coming through very slowly, but you know, TPUs will, are, will be just for AI uh, inference and whatnot. So everyone's still focusing on up here with the applications of AI. Everyone's trying to put real money here to really focus on being able to provide the infrastructure for the top tier. But very few people are even focusing on the energy and the land aspect. And so here's another, uh, oh, by the way, anyone know how old Larry is? He's 45. <laughs> <laughs> He was born 
in 1944. He's 80 years old. That was taken one week ago, that video. That is, I mean, if I, I want to look like that when I'm 80 years old. <laughs> so, yeah, but he's compass mentis, like he's really like still smart, smart, smart sharp as a tack. <laughs> um, anyway, the, yeah, so he's 80, that's impressive. Now, look at the electrical uh, stuff. So, consumption will rocket. By 2030, a trillion dollar compute cluster may need 20% of US electrical production. There is an epic second order consequence biz op here that not many are looking at in the electrical energy generation field. I was saying this last cut off. So, so this is one chart showing how you know, the large train cluster will, will need basically all of America's uh, energy. And the fact that the US has done absolutely jack shit. Sorry, sorry, Ellie. Um, has done bugger all. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Come on, that's child, that's it, ah. Uh, anyway, the US has done nothing in, next to nothing in, in increasing its energy generation for what, 20 something years? They've literally gone, hey, we're king of the world now, let's just sit back and chill out. What's China done? China's gone like, ha, huh, idiots. So China, as, as my, my facetious comment here is that if I was AGI or ASI that's just been born, the first thing it's going to look for is energy. Where is it going to live? The future AI will live in China, not America. Or at least it will, its main sort of compute clusters and stuff will be in China, because that's where all the power will be. And yeah, the US is nowhere near, nowhere near you know, even if they went, right, today we're going to put a trillion dollars into energy generation. How long does it take up to set up a nuclear power plant? 10 years, at, you know, I mean, what was the fastest the nukes have been set up? Seven years? I, I'm, you're going to have to fact check, I'm not sure, but... You don't want them to put corn into that, do you? No, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, 10 years to set up new, gener like, proper energy generation. So the US is buggered. Um, China is so far ahead of the curve. Um, and so I really want to buy shitloads of land, and I'll, I, I really want to have mezzanine, solar, and wind, or renewable energy um, infrastructure, but on a huge scale, because it is m money put into energy production and storage is not money wasted. It will have utility value forever. Even if you know, there's a massive spike in, in PV efficiency, so the average P PV efficiency right now is, what, 21%? So let's say you ploughed huge amounts of money into massive solar farms at 21%, and then let's say tomorrow, all of a sudden, Jeff Dahn creates new PV efficiencies and it's now 40%. It's a, it doesn't matter. Your farm will have utility value for the entire life duration of your panels. Um, so it's money well saved. It's, not, it's, it's there for preservation. It's the new property, in my opinion. Um, somewhere hot. <laughs> Yeah. So if I was going to do anything in the UK, it would be tidal wave. Yeah. So we're an island, so it makes sense to put as many tidal generations around. Um, maybe wind around Scotland, but there's lots of planning bollocks over there. So I don't know, just go somewhere south where the sun isn't an issue. We have a massive n nuclear fusion reactor in the sky that turns up every day. Um, so yeah, it'll be in another country for, for the AI type of stuff, for the, en for the energy. So carrying on with that, energy is going to be the biggest bottleneck, AI bottleneck that no one's really considering. And US energy production is just woeful. Uh, same with the UK, most of Europe as well. Um, yeah, everyone's already trying to do their compute clusters. Um, yeah. So here's, here's just, a, just incredible. So by 2030, you know, so Elon's got the biggest... AI supercompute cluster, and the most expensive one at the moment, but it's, it's feeble in comparison to what's inbound. So you know, by 2030, you're going to have a single compute cluster that, that could potentially take all of America's energy. Like, yeah. So, and this is where all of the boffins that 
government-funded energy agencies or energy monitoring agencies, they should all be fired because for the last 20 years they've always been wrong with when it comes to solar and solar and uh, battery um, efficiencies. Uh, yeah, efficiencies, because they, they always draw plateau lines. They're like, oh, yeah, it's going to be like this. It's going to be like this. But every single year, reality shows them something completely different. And I took this chart, and I was like, wait a minute. This is wrong, because they're saying that it's going to be like this over the, you know, the next 10 years. So I've just plotted what's actually happened over the last two years. That's the chart. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? This is the world. So all the experts with MBAs and all that sort of stuff and PhDs, they've been constantly wrong. Not just this chart. There are so many charts where they've gone PV efficiency or the cost of um, PV or battery. They're always wrong. This is what's happened in the last three years. And we haven't got the, all of 2024 data yet, obviously. So if 2024 is plotted in, I wouldn't be surprised if it's up here somewhere. No, this is actual installation right now. Yeah, actually installed. This is installed figures. So yeah, long story short, I want to plow a whole bunch of money into so, uh, renewable, harvestable energy sources.